So I have a, a new guest with me today on Grill Country. Joining us for the first time is Kenneth Lawrence. Uh, Kenneth and I uh, kind of follow each other on Twitter, and I had been reading uh, Bogakov's Jacob's Ladder, and uh, was kind of made an open call for, hey, who's interested in talking about this? And Kenneth uh, indicated that he was, and I said yes because I had um, I had uh, engaged with something that he had done previously. Um, for the symbolic world. And I thought he showed that he was a high quality thinker. So I thought he was somebody worth coming on and talking about uh, this book with. And so I just want to, I want to start off the conversation today. This is the first time Kenneth and I are talking. So I kind of want to talk a little bit about like, you know, who he, who Kenneth is and why he decided to, to read this book. And I'll kind of share some of my own so we can kind of get to know each other through the course of this conversation too. And I mean, hopefully we'll get at least to some of the meat of uh, Bogakov's text uh, in this conversation. So Kenneth, welcome to Grail Country. Um, Thanks for having and, me. And how did you uh, make the uh, this the strange life choice of deciding to read uh, Jacob's Ladder, which is one of Bogakov's lesser known works? Well, yeah. So, like you've indicated, um, I had, along with a with a friend, uh, Daniel Townhead, um, I had written an article or a series of articles for the Symbolic World blog on egregores, um, and I, um, you know, he and I were preparing to have a, a conversation with Jonathan Pajot on the articles, and I thought to myself, well, I, I probably better make sure I really like know what I'm talking about in terms of the traditional understanding of angels before I have this conversation. Um, I had read, you know, I want to say like probably most of the, um, of the primary works on, on angels from the relevant, uh, you know, fathers, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, a good deal of, of the esoteric literature on, on angels as well. Mm -hmm. Um, but I was kind of looking for a, a really, really comprehensive work that kind of spanned the gamut of, of like, um, basically all of the theology and everything the church um, has to say about angels. And and I had been reading uh, Bulgakov's other works at the time as well. And so I thought to myself, well, now, now's probably the perfect time to really dig into Jacob's Ladder. And so I read it and wow, it's, uh, it's for me, it's like, it's really one of those books that like is, is going to change the way that, that I think I, I look at the world. It's, it's a, uh, it's a tiny little book, but it's very, very information dense. And it's like so, just jam packed so how did you with, Sure. How did you come to be reading Bulgakov generally, though? Are you a theology student or are you just like, what's the what's what's the interest there? Because like not everybody reads Bulgakov. Sure. Yeah, that's that's a fair question. Uh, I'm, I'm actually a musician um, by trade. I, I do uh, yeah music production and audio production work for uh, a living. And so that's uh, pretty unrelated to my interest in, in theology. Um, but I. Is it I though? Guess, Particularly your fascination with angels, because to me, like there, there, there seems a connection here. Um, actually, there's, there, do you remember the passage in the in the book where Bulgakov is actually talking about music? Did you? Yeah, did that, angelic music. Yeah, angelic absolutely. music. Did that resonate with you? As it definitely did. Yeah, like uh, music of the spheres, that kind of thing. Um, I, you know, I studied classical music in school, um, and you know, read a little bit about, you know, uh, Kepler's ideas on music and, 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 you know, the harmony of the spheres and, and that whole concept. So that, that, that definitely resonated. Um, but no, I have, I have an interest in, in theology. I have an interest in, um, in, uh, I, I read a lot of, a lot of, uh, you know, works on hermeticism and esotericism. And so I'm, I'm super interested in that, uh, big Steiner fan. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, uh, I guess that was kind of like my primary interest for a number of years. I, I was raised Catholic um, and kind of took a pretty long, uh, you know, diversion away from it to explore other things like Eastern religion and, and uh, esotericism and things of that sort and kind of came back to the faith uh, relatively recently. Um, and uh, prior to that, my bread and butter had, had, had been young for a long time. So I was reading a lot mm. of Carl Jung uh, I was reading a lot of um, Steiner, uh, got turned on to, to Tom Berg. Um, and so kind of, I, I, guess, I guess I sort of came into proper theology through the back door. 
That's right. Um, so you're like, you're like me, like basically like your interest is not like primarily academic. It's just like, it's an interest. Yeah. It's an interest and I have no it. formal training in it. So yeah, same here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so this, I, no, I'm trying to, I'm trying to recall to memory and the, the section about music does not like, I believe Bulgakov actually refers to music as angelic speech in one portion of that. He did, well, fortunately for us, I have I've made an outline of the entire book so I can jump to the, the section where he talks about it. Let me see if I can find it. Um, sort of scrolling through it on my other screen here. There's some beautifully written prose in that section too. Uh -huh. Is this the, ch in the chapter about 124 to 125? It looks like okay. Ah, uh, um, yeah. He, well, he talks. He talks about the about angelic language separately from angelic music. Okay. Okay. Um. So I don't think he he sees them as the same thing. Um. The unceasing praise of the angels appears in Revelation as both, uh, audibly uh, as angelic singing and visibly through light, color, images, and forms. That that's one thing that really stuck out to me as being somewhat of a difference from other conceptualizations of angels that you hear from um you know from other sources where the angels are viewed as, you know, obviously they're completely incorporeal, um, but I think some theologians and, and thinkers more generally see angels as completely without form, completely almost as if they're without um, sort of experiential or phenomenological quality, right? Mm -hmm. Like they're, they're sort of like tra transcending any, any concept of, of color or light or form or anything like that. And I think here, Bulgakov is trying to um, offer somewhat of an opposing perspective to that view, saying like, like w within the realm of the angelic hierarchies um, is the foundation for everything that we- For everything, that, because yes. his, his understanding is, is essentially it's Sophianic because, so he's he sees angels as related to the prototypes of all things. Right, right. <laughs> so, right. yeah. Um, the okay so i think i know why i was thinking that because what he does what he does say yeah you're you're right what he does do is he he talks about music as essentially being sound in its most pure and natural form and being qualitative and not quantitative right. so i think in my mind that's like i related that to being like i related that to, to angelic speech because of that fundamental connection to sound in its its qualitative mode. Yeah, that that makes sense to me. And that you know, I, there there probably is a connection for for me personally with uh you know with my background in music and I just in asked you about conspiracy yeah. and that was like one of, that passage is really like it's really well crafted, um and was I found it to be like one of the more moving bits of prose in the book. So yeah, me too. When I got to that part, I was like, uh, I was just absolutely in awe uh, of, of what I was reading. Because you know, you don't really hear about that very often about angelic speech, angelic artistry, angelic right. music. These yeah. are things that, that you don't really get much of. Well, you do get a sense of it, I think, like, biblically and liturgically to an extent, but it's never made explicit in the way that Bulgakov uh, makes it. Right. I think that's one right. thing that he does really well kind of in general is he, he he's good at at kind of identifying where there are holes and um, mm -hmm. points of 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 um, underdevelopment, you know, with within patristic theology and within sometimes even within, you know, the dogma of the church. Um, mm -hmm. And he kind of makes things more explicit in, in a pretty bold way, I think. Right. Because really I puts think himself out there and, and yeah. I think he's, He's he's garnered some some criticism for that too, right? Because there's a certain, but I think well, here's the thing though. This is this is this is the way I view it. So almost every theologian that was really doing serious theology at some point was called a heretic. Yeah, I, like you at some point they were called a heretic, almost without exception. Um, because in order to in order to do theology really well, I think you just, you have to do it from a standpoint where you're emboldened by faith, where you know that, you know that what you are doing is, is trying to articulate the truth and that you just have to trust that, um, 
eventually the world will catch up to the truth that you're trying to elucidate. Mm. Mm. Um, I mean, even like, like I mean, you're a Catholic, right? So like even Aquinas, right. Who is like the defender of Catholic orthodoxy now was declared heretical in his time. Right. So the fact that Bulgakov, Bulgakov never actually, and he was accused of, but never officially, uh, never officially convicted of heresy. So he's not technically a heretic, although some of his doctrines were were were, call, were definitely called into scrutiny, and certain bodies did make judgments against him. There was no ultimate judgment against Bulgakov, so he's not technically a heretic. But even, but that to me that's almost beside the point because. <laughs> If you're if you're if you're doing theology correctly, you have to you have to risk heresy. Otherwise, you're not you're not you're not bringing any new light. That's a good point. I mean, he 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 remarks that you know we've and well at the time when he was writing in, in the 1920s, I suppose um, that we've embarked upon an era of um, like ultra conservatism within theology, where people are just content yes. to kind of rehash the same ideas over and over right. again with with just like more and more precision um and you know as far as i can tell and i've read quite a few of his works at this point and, and i am no authority on this of course i'm not like a, i'm not even like a you know a, a theology scholar a complete amateur i'm just reading this stuff for for fun basically and for my own enrichment but um i can't i can't find anything in bulgakov that is explicitly heretical um Again, right. as far as I know, the, the the all of the sociology stuff, I think people are just afraid to approach it because it's just it's unfamiliar. It's not something that they've heard. Um, you know, it's not something that has a, 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 an explicit foundation in, in patristics. So it's like right, right. it's, it's, a, it's no, a new he, thing that people approach cautiously. And I think for good for good reason, it's important mm -hmm. to, to approach things cautiously. Sure. Um, but I can't find anything in it that's that's uh, explicitly heretical. Right. Well, we can leave that question aside. Um, so let's get we're here to talk about today about about uh, um, about the book on angels, Jacob's Ladder. Right. Um, so uh, what do you think? What's your big what is your biggest takeaway from this book? Like, what is it? What is it Bogakov gave you in the way you view angels that say maybe you didn't get from Aquinas or Dionysius? or you know anyone else who uh has written about angels uh in the history of the church like what is what is bulgakov's unique insight sure i think he's got a few i think the the biggest thing that stood out to me is the way that bulgakov attempts to really definitively marry um plato's forms with the angelic hierarchies mm -hmm. like he 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 basically uh, makes that very very clear that he thinks that that he 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 thinks that plato was more or less correct um but he tries to update plato in certain really important ways and the main way in which he updates plato is he takes the the forms which in plato are these sort of uh impersonal ab abstractions and he identifies them uh or infuses them rather with a sense of sort of christian personhood so right. the the forms become the multi hypostatic angelic assembly, right? Um, he reconnects them and he reconnects them to to ancient paganism because you can understand you can begin to understand how the language of forms and the language of gods are all are are talking about the same thing to a certain degree, and that also because he ties it directly to angels you can see how the Hebrew idiom of speaking about angels is also related. I don't Are you familiar with Margaret Barker's work at all? Vaguely. Okay. Vaguely, yeah. So Margaret Barker lays out in some of her books, um, a fairly decent argument that, and actually you can see this, this is actually within the Greek tradition. This is like the Greeks will tell you this is that Pythagoras got his knowledge from Jerusalem. So mm. And, Pythag and Platonism comes directly out of Pythagoras. Like there's a direct line between Pythagoras and Socrates and from Socrates to Plato. So ultimately the roots of Platonic thought really do reach back to what would be first temple Jewish mysticism. 
Mm, like so that is that is the root so and 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 uh margaret barker actually makes the argument that there's a direct connection to isaiah to the prophet we know as isaiah okay uh, that isaiah was the teacher of pythagoras wow, so I, I've never this idea that, that there is a divide between between jerusalem and athens and that uh, we make a mistake in reading Christian tradition through this kind of Neoplatonic lens is, is dangerous. Okay. It is completely repudiated by that. If you can establish that the very roots of, of Greek philosophy go back to the first temple mystical traditions of Judaism, which later reemerge as Kabbalah. Right. Right. So, yeah. I, that's that, that rings true to me. I, I mean, I haven't read any of Margaret Barker's work. I've, I've, <laughs> I have to admit, I've, I've watched a few like YouTube commentary videos um, about it, um, but I've never actually uh, engaged with the text directly. But so I'll need to do that. But um, yeah, I mean, Bulgakov does come out and and directly say that the you know the Greek gods and goddesses um, were were basically just like angels misidentified. Correct. Right. That's that's, that's right. kind of what he says. Which, which is ties which up runs. With the which ties up with the biblical idea of the angels of the nations. True. Yeah. Right. Very true. Very yeah. true. Yeah. He says that he, well, yeah. So he, he's saying at one point that every nation has a guardian angel, mm -hmm. um, even the pagan nations as attested to in scripture. Right. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think his viewpoint on gods and goddesses runs contrary to, um, to a lot of Orthodox thought, which, um, wants to say that that all gods and goddesses all pagan deities of any kind are demons right? right you see that you see that from time well, to time this is where the egregore concept comes in because i don't like tomber actually makes the argument that the the gods the gods that were that were having human sacrifice brought before them uh in in the in the old testament they are egregores that they are not that they are no part of they are no part of either the heavenly hierarchy or the hierarchies of evils but they are actually egregores created by corrupt human aspirations right right and you can kind of see like if you look at if you if and essentially what's going on with what we're describing with this egregore language in our age is also related to this same idea of wrong sacrifice yeah, that's true. Did we you see we did, that connection. We yeah, we made the Daniel and I made the connection um, in our articles uh, about about we 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 spent some time talking about attention and and worship and sacrifice right. and how uh, incorrectly channeling one's attention towards certain uh, angelic principles um, can kind of like turn that principle into more of an egregore or demonic entity. Um, we actually disagreed with with Tom Berg on on um, denying any connection to the heavenly hierarchies um, and the, the the pagan gods and goddesses. Um, but I don't really know. Well, you could have. No, so here's the thing, though. You could have like you could have like. Okay, let's 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 divide up. Let's let's pretend. Let's pretend for a moment that the that the early modern missionaries' viewpoint that all pagan deities are demons is false. Let's let's entertain that for a moment, right? right? Let's say that some of them are actually proper gods of those nations that are being worshipped in lieu of the god through no fault of the angel itself. It's not like the angel is asking for the worship, but it is just that they're the something about the consciousness of well i don't want to get i don't want to get into it introduce extra language here but that the i'm trying to i'm trying to figure out how to express this without using barfieldian language um because i don't want to confuse our audience um essentially that yeah what's actually okay let's 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 okay forget that okay our feeling back, language back, back, back. is fine by me for the record. Right. But. But, and I use it a lot of my channels, but my audience probably be confused by it. But I want to talk, I want to, I want to put this in biblical language in this particular context. So if you think about what it's, it's a similar to what happens with the law, according to St. Paul, right? St. Paul says that the law actually comes through an angel and not from God directly. 
right? So did the angel who present the law, did he do something wrong in presenting the law, even though he, he was, he was acting it, the people weren't going, weren't getting it directly from God. Does that mean that the angel who was doing that was, was somehow culpable? So what's wrong is a, what's wrong potentially is not like, it's not that the being itself is evil. It's that the way that the people are interacting with the being is wrong. So that might be a class where you actually have a being that is generally potentially part of even the heavenly hierarchy, but is being interacted with in a way that is wrong. I agree with that wholeheartedly. That's okay. That, I mean, I think that that's more or less the vision that that Bulgakov puts forward. Um, I don't think he says that directly, but but I think that's kind of what you can you can um, intuit from from what he says, and. Uh, it's definitely what I would what I would argue. I I don't see how that necessarily makes it an egregore. Per se. No, no, I'm actually saying this would not be. I have I'm getting. Oh, got, I'm it, getting, got it. I'm getting there. I'm getting. Got it, sorry, there. I'm Jumped getting there. there. However, like you can think now. Now I'm going to try it again. I want to use this in biblical language. I want to write this in biblical language so people don't get freaked out by what I'm saying. Okay, sure. So I want to use biblical examples. So. If you look at the way Satan interacts with God in the book of Job, you can see that there's some sort of like, there are rules about what the what the hierarchies of evil are allowed to do in connection to us, right? They can serve as sources of temptation, etc. But there's no indication that they have license to actually accept direct worship. Hmm. Right. I, I don't see any indication of that unless you're unless you're deciding that God equals automatically equals demon. But I don't think that necessarily follows. However. The category of beings like something like, you know, Baal or. Um, uh, um, it, like any of the gods to whom like sacrifice were, were offered like Baal Hamon. The, the the deity to whom uh, babies were sacrificed in the Tophet by the the Phoenicians like that is the class of the thing of the kind of thing that Tomberg would say no this is clearly not a member of the hierarchies of evil because it is not it is acting in a way that is against the accord between have between heaven and hell essentially between the what allows for there to the temporary truce between heaven and hell before the before the before the end of all things. Hmm. So because this the, the actions of these entities are so malevolent in violation of anything that would be permitted under heaven, um, then it has to be evil of our own generation. So we have to have essentially given collective consciousness to these these malevolent beings who I think are correctly viewed as not actually being a real center of consciousness. Right. Hmm. Hmm. Right. So they're that's, not really, how we define... they're not really hypostatic. Uh, okay. Yeah. So that's, that's more or less how we define egregores in our, in um, our articles as we right. said that we classify them as kind of like headless entities, right. Where yes. it's, it's like a, it's sort of, there, whatever the angelic principle is, which is onto, ontologically rooting the the phenomenon, uh, you know, in the world, that's being sort of relegated to the background. And what's coming to the fore is this kind of structure that's that's a, a parasitized structure, right? It's being parasitized by by uh, a host of of demonic entities, and the resulting uh, the resulting unity is not hypostatic. Right. It's a it's like a co combination of, of a lot of uh, demonic hypostases, if you will. Oh, OK. Well, but, and, but those are dime. OK, so here's we go. There, now. We, now we're going to enter into dialogue with Bulgakov's text, because I think that there is there's something that's implicit. But in, in the way that uh, Bulgakov talks about the guardian angel, I think that you can kind of in, you can also intuit the presence of a personal demon as well so like almost like the literal and i think Peugeot is actually would agree with this because i think i i think i've actually seen him suggest as much where it's like almost like the the image in the cartoon where the with mm. with where you have the devil and the angel on the shoulder right 
So you have the guardian angel, which is like your prototype. And then you have like the personal devil, which is the thing which is trying to drag, to essentially drag you into, to non-love, to non-reality, to non-being. So, right? uh, so it might... is the collective energies of these forces in combination that create the egregore. But ah. it doesn't have its own individual hypostasis in the way that, let's say, an angel who was being falsely worshipped as a god is that's a it's a real hypostasis. It's a real it's a real center of consciousness. It's a real person in a way that the egregore is not. Right. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, that that certainly makes sense. I would say that Bulgakov's view on that is is slightly more nuanced. Um, and he I don't know if you've read um, Bride of the Lamb, but in Bride of the Lamb, he he explicitly rejects the the like uh angel on the on the on the right and devil on the left thing because mm -hmm. he says that it, it, there is no such thing as as like a, a as a demonic um like anti-angel he says that that uh what you have instead there there isn't there isn't such a thing as like a parody between the guardian angel and like one's like anti-guardian angel there's there's instead a, a fragmented host of of demonic entities which fill the void left by the guardian angel and that's why the resulting entity on the left doesn't have a true hypostasis because it's like a, it's right. a combination that's why of a bunch it's of things yeah right. yeah gotcha yeah that's right good good yeah okay so um well i, I think we kind of covered some of your previous work there um, so that that's good. So let's talk about um, let's get let's bring it back to to Jacob's ladder here. So what do you think is the from your reading of the text? What do you think is the the key distinction between the angelic and the human? Mm. What is the distinction between the angelic and the human? Um, the way I see it, and <laughs> forgive me if I'm if I'm trying out some new ways of of, of phrasing this because uh, to be frank, you're the people. first person I've talked to about this because not many people have read this book. Um, the difference between the human and the angel is that the human, well, maybe we have to maybe we have to take a few steps back in order to paint this picture. the The picture that Bulgakov paints is mm -hmm. that heaven is the multi-hypostatic angelic assembly right it's right. it's it's um it's fully uh defined by the hypostases of of the angels right that's what heaven is right. uh, every he says everything everything heavenly is personal um mm -hmm. so every angel is a person every angel and he equates uh personal being with uh self-consciousness which is a, i think a, a an interesting kind of modern move um and he also he also equates it with with the word spirit and he equates it with uh capital i kind of in the steinerian sense mm -hmm. um Mugakov takes a lot from steiner by the way without while, while keeping him at a distance um, i actually did i actually finally i've i've no i've seen the influence pretty obviously in lots of places I actually did finally find in his uh, in his in his book on the Holy Eucharist and the Grail, there is actually a footnote where he acknowledges Steiner. Oh wow! Well, it's yeah, it's not not surprising because you can, it's it's all over the place. You can tell he's like he yeah. takes a lot from Anthroposophy and Theosophy, but he again he just like he does with Plato, he corrects. Rodiaev actually and, attended Steiner's lectures too. Ah well, and well, and I know that there's some connection between uh, Bulgakov and Solovyev as well, and then yes. obviously Solovyev was was um, linked in with the, with Anthroposophy uh, to a degree. Um, Bulgakov is more closely linked with Florensky, but yes, certainly, yeah. like both yeah. they're so both sociologists. Yeah. So, so anyway, sorry that long digression there. So, 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 the multi hypostatic assembly of heaven. Uh, is reflected in the earth and her, the earth is basically based on the foundation um, set forth by the multi hypostatic assembly, but in uh, sort of like things of mineral and inorganic nature, we see sort of like the highest hierarchies 
reflected in the earth in a kind of diffuse manner, right? And as uh, we get closer and closer to the human being, um, sort of in the the chain of of natural being on the earth, we get closer and closer to a, a an unmediated or direct reflection of of the angel the angelic form. Mm-hmm. So it's like if 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 there's like this if you can picture like a mirror uh, that's kind of like dividing heaven and earth, and like the upper hierarchies are over here, and like mineral nature is over here. The closer you get to the surface of the mirror, it's like the closer the actual essence of the the angelic hypostasis is reflected in the creaturely form so the human being is like the most direct reflection of the angelic form that's the way that, that i see it yeah and so much so and actually what i was trying to get you to is like like the the, the key conception that kind of holds it all together is that he posits throughout the book this idea that angels have a co-humanity and that man has a that the human beings have a co-angelicity. And again, to bring in the, the the scriptural reference to kind of ground this so that you we can see that he's not just it's not just blind speculation. He uses the image of the heavenly Jerusalem right. as his kind of, as as kind of his starting point for this uh, for this line of reasoning, because the heavenly Jerusalem is is said to have the measure of an angel and the measure of a man. Right. He goes, I'll, I'll give you so a quote it hints from that at part. like, yeah, go for it. He says, uh, let's see, the human measure, which is also the angel's measure, the exposition of these mysterious words of revelation constitutes the chief task of the present work, and in them is expressed the fundamental and sole idea, or its fundamental and sole idea, rather. So he, he, he comes out and says, like, at the end of the book, like, like that image of 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 the so that of like that the parity between the angelic and the human measure is kind of like the whole essence of this book. Yes, yes, and it's like yes. the foundation for 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 this whole entire viewpoint. That that quotes on page one sixty one, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> so the other like, and one of the like one of the one of the thoughts that I thought was interesting in terms of the way he distinguishes between. Like so, we have this we have this connection, right? Which is most profoundly connected through the guardian angel, which is essentially when you come down to it, the way Bulgakov presents it, without ever saying this explicitly, he definitely implies that it's the heavenly prototype of of a particular individual person. Although mm-hmm. he's open to the idea that a single guardian angel, although it's definitely a person, could have charge over multiple persons, right? But he doesn't, he tends not to think that because the number of angels uh, is traditionally held to be much greater than the number of human beings. So there's no shortage of angels. So there's no reason that you couldn't actually have a specific heavenly prototype for each person. And I think that I would, I would argue that the nature of hypostasis would almost require that. Yeah. To me. So I would say that that, that is probably where i would be most inclined to find his his thought landing i'm kind of sidetracking myself there a little bit but the point is is that this, he makes this distinct he makes he distinguishes this idea that the primary difference between the angelic and the human is in having a world oh i see what you yeah okay so i see what you were getting out that question now yeah yeah and the idea of having a world and here's the thing is i actually think this has connected to this i, I there's a actually let me see if i can find uh see if i can find where it is in the transcript because this is a uh jordan daniel wood did a video uh on uh love unrelenting recently where he was talking about uh, maximus the confessor's idea of sin and uh yeah here we go let me just go ahead and looks like it's from well i'll just summarize it because i can't find the exact right time sure and I, I and i didn't and i just kind of thought of it in the moment Um, So essentially, he says that when 
So where we cross over the line from temptation to evil, and it's Bulgakov seems to think that angels can. So for Bulgakov, for Bulgakov, unlike say Aquinas, angels are definitely not unmutable and unchangeable. This is a very right. important they distinction. They can progress right. in their in their angelicity. I think is the way that he puts it. Correct. Which I think means that they can also be tempted. I think, and I think this, I mean, even Christ was able to be tempted, although he didn't fall into temptation. So I don't think there's much, I think that's theologically sound to suggest that an angels can be tempted. But I think this lack of a world, this lack of a world is why their temptation can never actually result in evil. Hmm. And here's the deal. And this, and, and I get this, I get, I got this idea from kind of connecting what Bulgakov says here to what Jordan Daniel Wood was saying about Maximus the Confessor's theory of sin. Because essentially what Maximus says about sin is that it, it requires this having a world in order to actually cross over into actual evil, right? As opposed to just being tempted. So there's this, you know, just, so just having a bad thought, like we want to avoid them, but you haven't committed any, you haven't actually committed evil yet and having a bad thought, right? Right. You have to actually, you have to actually take that bad thought and you have to turn it into, into something that you try to instantiate in reality, in the world. So it requires you in order to do evil, you have to have a world. So the the lack of angelic capacity to do evil is actually connect. I would suggest and this is not something Bulgakov says. This is just me adding on top of like making connections to other things and suggesting that this is precisely why the angels are uh, are automatically good. Like once they pass to the good. Once once yeah. their temptation has been passed, right? So mm -hmm. once that they did once they didn't follow Satan and they've passed that initial test of temptation, they are fixed in the good because they don't possess a world. And I think there's definitely an idea like if you can see the you could this is really becoming obvious in the way the, the machine is operating now. But it's very clear that what the hierarchies of evil want to do is to embody themselves and to have a world through us. Mm. Right? So so that they can have the capacity to actually instantiate, to incarnate evil. I wouldn't argue with that. I, hmm. So uh, according to that view, then, how would the fall of the angels be possible uh, to begin with, I guess, would be my question. Because they're mutable and changeable, and they were attracted to the earth. Because hmm. the earth is like, so... Because the earth isn't the earth was was created good and it was inherently attractive, but they want but they wanted so they wanted to own something that wasn't proper to their nature, right? Mm. So they fall like they so they lost from they, they went from the gravitational pull of uh, of uh, of God and the heavenly hierarchies down and fell toward the gravitational pull of the earth because they wanted that which was not natural to 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 angels it was not for angels to have a world right but then how does that how does that explain why they are then the the demons are then fixed toward evil and the good angels are fixed toward the good well that's another discussion for another day and that's ah, sure and sure, if we're going to sure. talk about it in bulgakov's thought then we know where bulgakov goes with that well i think he he <laughs> seems to posit that there is that the there's a kind of uh event horizon uh at the beginning of time that's analogous to the event horizon at the end of time mm -hmm. things become right, fixed right. toward the good so it's like human beings pass over that event horizon and and at a certain point achieve a certain fixity toward the good in the eschaton right whereas the good angels have already passed that event horizon for themselves like the, and know, they're the trying game. to draw us towards it in the case of the guardian angels right right yeah, yeah that's right yeah yeah it's interesting but I, would, I, well, I mean in bulgakov it like yeah i'm trying to remember where it is um i think it might be on his essay against uh conditionalism he actually he actually writes um this passage about like 
So this is actually related to the guardian angel. So this actually does relate to this book. And there's actually like, there's a passage from Sophiology Death, of Death in the introduction um, of, the, of this book too. So um, what he suggests is that uh, essentially your what you are what you are judged what what you are judged by, obviously all judgment happens through Christ but also that judgment happens through your own higher self right, right? so your guardian angel participates in that in that judgment and basically in like through Christ right in seeing whether like whether you have conformed to the image of what you were intended to be or not right that there's, yeah. a, there's a petition patient of that but ultimately for Volgakov, there is a like there's a eventually there's a restoration toward that it, through suffering eventually like there's he's he's a he's an unambiguous universalist right well not interestingly not yet not in this, in this book. work not yeah, in this not work yet. in this work yeah. he hedges in this work he hedges but yeah in this book he, he says that's like it's basically the question is out of bounds i think is right. what it says right right yes um and it's not much later after this where he where, where he he goes in a different direction but that's absolutely correct he is not in this text he is well what he says still leads to a universalist conclusion. <laughs> right. You can right. tell, so you, you know the, what he, you know what he thinks, but he hasn't he, If he follows it. his own reasoning, he has to get there. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, it's not surprising that he does based on like, actually, especially on the very introductory part of the ver first part of the introduction. But in any case, the part that I wanted to mention is that he actually sees the angel Lucifer as in that same capacity, judging satan mm. i don't remember reading that part but that's it's not in I this mean, book it's not in this book because that's I'm, that's I'm kind of like an organist uh that is from that that is actually i believe that's from his essay it's from i know it's from it's it's from sophiology of death but i don't remember which essay it's from wow um i can probably try to send it to you later um mm, origin's different I, I wouldn't say that's precisely originist. I mean, if you if you mean an if you mean originist in terms of that um he originist only in the sense of he cannot he he is not going to allow for any presence of evil in the final state of things. But I think that's necessarily the case. Yeah. Well, I just mean in otherwise the sense you're of, falling into a dualism. Yeah. Yeah. I just mean in the sense of 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 you said you mentioned. I think the way you phrased it was like Satan or Lucifer judging Satan, right? Like like Correct. the idea that there that there is like this something some kernel of of um, original uh, goodness, correct, like lying underneath the hypostasis, which is Satan, right? The corrupted hypostasis, which is Satan, yeah. which ultimately has the power in the very end of things like at beyond the end of time by the way well Gokov is very clear that like when you're talking about like when you're talking about that final restoration of all things you're talking about the very last of things after the end of time right the dual dual eschatological horizon correct kind of correct yeah correct which is not precisely the same as what origin does right true so that's true. why i wanted to draw a distinction there even though ultimately, yes, they will. I mean, they ultimately both of them, both of them would say that when it says God will be all in all, it means God will be all in all. Um, I, I like, but you've read some Tomberg, right? Yeah, or yeah. just about the egregores. Okay, so I like Tomberg says something interesting about this. Um, in Letter Eleven and Meditations on the Tarot on the Letter on Force, and he's he talks about, um the idea of conquering your enemies, right? And what he says is, is that the enemy is not truly conquered, but merely defeated until the enemy becomes the friend. Hmm. So if the story we're telling is actually the conquest of evil, then it has to result in, the, in, in, in its transformation as well. 
ultimately non-love and non-being cannot enter into eternal love and eternal being. Yeah. I mean, that makes sense can. to me. Right. I, I lean toward, uh, toward universalism. Like I, I won't come out and say that, that I, that like categorically that I uh, subscribe to that view for, for several reasons, but, but yeah, I definitely think that, that well, but here's there's a lot thing, of logic though. behind it. Here's the thing though. You can, here's, this is the other, this is the other thing where Tom, this is actually Tom Berg is also very good on this. Tom Berg actually shows the way that you can absolutely confirm, you can absolutely affirm the doctrine of eternal hell and support the universal restoration at the, at the same time without contradiction. Okay. Um, but I'll leave that for another time. <laughs> well, <laughs> Cause that's, cause we'll get, we'll get, we'll get sidetracked. Now you got me curious. I want to know. I, I'll, I've, I'm reading yeah. meditations on the tarot. I have not, okay. uh, at that I'll point, direct you to, I will, nine. I will direct you to the chapter where he specifically makes that argument. Um, cool. it, it has to do with, basically it has to do with not reducing everything to quantity mm. at the end of the day, which is kind of what we tend to do. What was kind of what we are really prone to do in our, in our, in our era. Um, and he kind of takes his clue from Berdayev a little bit. Um, but I'll, uh, after, afterwards, I'll link you, um, that section of the text. And yeah. I'd you. love to see that. The, so what, it, what it brings to mind, uh, this kind of the enemy becoming the friend, I think it links back to what you were saying earlier about the guardian angel kind of like judging the human being in terms of how, uh, uh how well the human being sort of conforms to the, the, uh, the intention for it, right? Intention Which is laid out is exactly in the right. in yes. the guardian angel. Right. And that it kind of this sort of like everything being judged by Christ and, and this this idea of sort of like these syzygic pairs uh yes. that that Bulgakov describes that kind of like form these like syzygic rings of love, like in the chain mm -hmm. of being. Yeah, that's I think a great part. It, it relates to my mind back to Saint Maximus's five divisions. Um, right, right. You have these kind of like five principal dualities, which are kind of like nested uh, fractally within each other that, that all sort of come together and are healed or, 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 or unified in Christ. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's really like the overarching vision. I think that Bulgakov puts forward like in, in Jacob's ladder is these, these rings. I think of everything love. that Bulgakov does is trying to advance the Maximian corpus. I really do. That's a good I, point. That's a good point. I yeah. really think that's what he's doing. Um, that he's definitely is the, the theologian he's most influenced by is Maximus. And is without a doubt, what he's trying to do is he's trying to take the Neo-Chalcedonian theology and to advance it. Yeah. So well, so he's stage. He's so for 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 Bulgakov, it's like everything that exists has an other, right? Like everything has a friend, like right. both yes. at a horizontal level and a vertical right. level. So right. like throughout the entire chain of being, there are entities, and they're they're like he uses the Gnostic term syzygy, which you could either take or leave. But I th right. I, I think it's actually kind of apropos. Um, but and maybe he gets that from Solovyev. I don't know. Uh, but. Well, a lot of language, I mean, in the case of syzygy, this is not the case, but a lot of times language that we consider Gnostic is actually apostolic language. We right. Just, it's just biblical. We just translate it differently. Right. We leave it in uh, the Greek to to, to make sure right. people know it's Gnostic, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, right. right. Precisely. Yeah. It just means, yeah. If you leave, if you leave biblical language in the Greek, it sounds Gnostic. Folks. Well, he uses the, the word syzygy all the time, and he makes frequent frequent uh, recourse to the concept of the pleroma, um, yes. like all throughout his corpus. And I think I I I've always found those two particular concepts to be the most so, sort of um, useful and and redeeming concepts from uh, from Gnosticism. I think there's right. I, don't, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. But so he's got he's got yeah just these everything has an other and in the chain of being there are these kind of like rings that, that are formed of of entities and groups of entities and like the other which corresponds to it which has to be kind of united to the yeah, theme in, right in these these sort of um uh, concentric pairs right which all come together in christ it's a really profound cosmic image yeah, it kind of reminds me of a couple things. It reminds me. It reminds me of um, uh, uh, of uh, um, the uh, 
from the symposium uh uh aristophanes like tale of uh like the the the, the two parts seeking their other half mm. so it kind of it kind of it kind of reminds me of that um a little bit um and then um and my thought was going with this oh yes have you okay i remember where i was going with this now have you do you have you happen to have read uh martin shaw's book the wild twin no i have not okay so martin shaw he wrote this like before his conversion his recent conversion to christianity he wrote this a book called the wild twin and he talks about this idea of the wild twin and talks about how you know the seeking out the wild twin but the way he talks about the wild twin very much to me seems connected to the way Bulgakov is talking about the guardian angel. Mm. So it's almost like this connection to the wild twin that Martin Shaw writes about is probably telling the tale of his own eventual journey toward Christ. Oh, interesting. Like, in seeking out that wild twin, he came in connection with it, especially through his like mystical experiences he's had um, through his wilderness fasting, like I think he was making contact with his guardian angel, which I think is what led him on the path that he's now on. Um, so um, that's the thing that's that's the thing here. I think Bulgakov seems to suggest that everyone has a guardian angel, right? It's not limited to the baptized faithful. He even goes so far as to say that that is part of the definition of being a human. Yeah. At right. one point, at, at the beginning of the book, he's kind of a, like he he's ambiguous about it, and he says like uh, he he conjectures that that everybody has a guardian angel, and then later in the book, he definitively says like it you know in order to be a human means to have a guardian angel, which is really not. So, it's, here's the, the thing though: is ultimately that's no different than saying that you exist in the mind of God. Right. It's saying right. the same thing. It's the, yeah, I, I agree. Those two things are synonymous. <laughs> yeah. Right. And it, what is it? Is what exists in the mind of God is what? It's it's not it's not a it's not a non hypostatic idea. No, your person exists in the mind of God, like within with with within divine Sophia, like. And it's at an some point you incarnate. At some point you incarnate. I think it's an interesting distinction because some people want to equate the like uh, the maximian conception of the logoi with the angels and i think it's like slightly different uh, to, to me i kind of see the angels as created beings as being sort of like one step removed from the logoi right because the logo yeah because i think the logoi is actually like the way in which everything is connected to the to the hypothesis of the divine son Right, right. So, so in the Godhead, right? So uncreated. Yeah, exactly. Images, so that's which, the, which then are mirrored in the in the right. first in the created heaven and secondly in in earth. Or yeah. So earth. we can consider this entire book like supplemental to <laughs> to, to that to that understanding of Maximus. For so, sure. For yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, anything else that you wanted to talk about, like from the book? Gosh, there's it's. He there's goes into so he, there's there's uh, there's so much to talk about. I mean, he asks some really really interesting questions. One of them is like, do the angelic hierarchies have any connection to the three um, persons of the Trinity? Mm -hmm. I thought that was a super interesting question. It's a very interesting question. And he basically gives the answer that there's no um, the Church has nothing definitive to say about it, but you can find lots of uh, support liturgically and biblically biblically for the idea of there being a connection that mm -hmm. like certain angels are connected with the father certain angels with the son certain angels with the holy spirit um and that the angelic hierarchies the three by three by three roughly correspond to that same structure as well mm -hmm. right and he goes he goes on to kind of describe that the the angels of the of the the father are those that are kind of most directly turned toward God, right? In like continuous uh, doxology, as he calls it. Right. Um, and then the the angels of the word are the kind of like uh, the ideal uh, prototypes or like the content of the, of the world. And then the, this is where I think it gets the most interesting. And I think where he's, he, he is most closely in line with uh, Steiner, mm -hmm. where he says that the angels of the third hypostasis of the Trinity are the divine spirit souls 
as he mm -hmm. calls them. So these are kind of like the, the, the words sort of, uh, ensheathed in beauty. Right. So mm. like, and they take on more particularized form and actually become life forms. So like the, the, the angels of the third hypostasis are kind of like the proto, the, the more particularized prototypes for like living beings is basically what he says. Yeah. And, and you can see how he's connected. He has a real, this is one thing I noticed. He has a, okay, well, I, I have to bring in Barfield now. He has, it seems to have an innate intuitive sense of the real connection between spirit, breath, and wind, which allows mm. him to, when he when, when he's engaging in pneumatology, it allows him to write some pretty remarkable sentences. There is a line from the introduction that really stood out to me where he says... Where is it? Oh, I didn't. I'll have to paraphrase it because I can't. I didn't highlight it. Um, he says he says something to effect that like, uh, the spirit is the breathing of the uh, of the eternally spoken word of the Father. Something mm -hmm. to that. Something to that effect. Where it's like his very conception of the uh, of the of the hypostasis of the spirit is connected to um to the idea of breath and the to the idea of wind and i think those like the those kinds of hierarchical forces that you're talking about you can see how they have like a um a symbolic connection to that kind of like because of their fluidity you know what i'm saying right yeah yeah um so yeah that's that's all he, he 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 makes a lot of really interesting connections, I think, like to the Trinity, um, in a more robust fashion that you than you see in a lot of other theologians. Like he he makes a I think an, a pretty explicit connection between the good, the true, and the beautiful, uh, like Plato's conception of good goodness, truth, and beauty with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And then he makes a, a more explicit connection between like the 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 principle or the the quote unquote capital I. Right yeah. and, or self consciousness with the father, and then this sort of sort of self disclosure of that that consciousness as the son or the word, right. and then the kind of living out of that word right. in the world as the the Holy Spirit. Right. And he says that there's um, at least some evidence for a correspondence um, between that model and the angelic hierarchies, and you see that in in scripture. You see it in like the three angels that appear to Abraham. You see it in. Um, like the the icon of the synaxis of the arch archangels um and so he i think he 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 makes a pretty convincing case for there being a correspondence between the the persons of the trinity and the the and the, the three main angelic ranks right um yeah there are a, there are there there are some people who do not have a uh, guardian angels for well Gokov, though do we want to do we want to make mention of that Oh yeah, this this part is fascinating, and some of these uh, examples I actually don't understand. So I'll be curious to okay, hear your okay, take on it. Okay. Okay. So, so, well, first of all, it's John, right? It's John the Evangelist, because like it's his own guardian angel, and I don't because he's yeah. You can because, explain this to me. That's because he's held to be the angel. There's this tradition of holding him as the angel man within Orthodox tradition, right? So like he actually, so he doesn't represent like the full incarnation in the way that christ does but his angel his angelic and human natures are already unified and the and the and the the and he also has a miraculous birth and a special mission so there's like so he is he's different in that he is like he is living out his his full capacity from the beginning essentially Right. Um, as the forerunner of Christ. So that's so that's exception one. So uh, that so, makes sense. I think framing it in terms of like living out the, the full like living one's life to the full capacity of the divine intention for that life. I think that, that that's right. And that's yeah. it. That's and that's why, because it's like he he his intention is the forerunner. He fulfilled. He completely successfully fulfills his mission as the forerunner. He has embodied and lived out and in, in, incarnated his intended purpose by God 
So he has no there 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 he has no guardian angel. He is his own guardian angel. He's essentially he was his angelic and human nature were were united from birth. There was right. never a there was never a separation uh, between the two. It's just an interesting point because you don't really get that in in Catholicism. To to my at least to my understanding, I've never no, heard I've it. never heard uh, that. That seems to be that seems to be an Orthodox thing. I know it's not just Bulgaka because I have seen that in other Orthodox sources. Sources this idea of yeah of of John the Baptist as an angel man. Um. So um. And then uh, uh then Christ is obviously an exception too. Right. Um, yeah. He talks about how yeah, Christ doesn't have a guardian angel because Christ is like the is above all of the angels, of correct. course, and is, is the 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 divine hypostasis takes on both natures. And so there is there is not a guardian angel required. Um, I think that one's more or less more or less obvious. He goes into where, where he, when he talks about the Theotokos and and how she lacks a a prototype, but she has. A, uh, an angelic guardian i think that was yes, a pretty right interesting which is interesting yeah because she doesn't yeah exactly that's the most interesting case to me because he's because for the most part he's saying that these guardian angels are the angelic prototype and he's saying in the case of the, the reason she doesn't have an angelic prototype type prototype by the way is that essentially she is the creaturely version of the entirety of sophia that's right. why she doesn't have a singular angelic prototype because she's the god bearer Right. So it's, she's like the totality of the creation as intended is, is represented in her. So there's no way that she could have like a singular hypostasis, but the archangel Gabriel has a special role as her protector. Right. So that's the distinction he's making. Right. And and the archangel Gabriel is is the the his kind of function or role in the world is to herald the, the, the coming of, of the sun, right? right? And so like every time you get a right. type of that in scripture, like Gabriel is involved like to some degree. Um, right. So yeah, I just thought, I think in the, in the way that he kind of frames the, the issue of, of prototype in relationship to the mother of God, I think that's something that where that, that's, that's one of those places where people might take issue, right. Mm -hmm. With, with like kind of how he, he kind of wants to, to, to see the, the Virgin as kind of an, uh, an incarnation of something from within the Godhead, right. Like namely the essence of, of, of the Godhead itself. And I think that's probably theologically where some people might have, um, you know, some discomfort in, in, in accepting that idea. But I, to me, it, it makes sense. I, I, it, and when, and when you see it, um, when you read the way, like the, the wonderfully poetic way that, that he kind of words all this stuff, it, it makes total sense. And it doesn't seem heretical to me, but we don't have to go there, but that's no, just we like, go there. Yeah. Well, I mean, people know I go there all the time. <laughs> I, I, Michael Martin, the sociologist is a regular uh, uh, conversant on my channel. Um, so yeah, I go there. Um, I just actually had, uh, uh, Dr. Matthew Milliner on recently and we talked about his book, the mother of the lamb. Um, oh, that's right. Did that come out yet? Is that, did you put it that just out? came out? Yeah. Oh, the okay. video is out. Yeah. And, and the book is out. Um, and it's, it's interesting. It, it's a great book. Uh, it's really, um, he's an art historian, so it's not like he has a uh, seminary training, but it's not primarily a theological book. He's an art historian who's tracing the history of an icon and then looking at the theological implications that go along with that in, uh, in a great way. And I think that like a lot of times these things that we get hung up on when we try to, and I, this is why I'm somewhat, sometimes even I, I myself am hesitant to express these things um, in kind of propositional ways, because I don't think these are things that we actually approach very well in that way. I think we do better when we approach them. I think that we do better when we approach them through images, when we approach them through intuition, when we approach them indirectly, and that we, when we try to systematize them, we kind of tend to get, you know, to get them wrong, which is what, I mean, which is, I'm sure that like it, but, which brings us back to talking about Bulgakov's systematic theology. Is it possible that he got some technical things wrong um, in when he was trying to, uh, explain sophiology in a systematic way yes entirely possible right um 
does that mean that it necessarily follows that the thing that he was trying to make comprehensible through systematic language, does it still mean that that it's not he's not talking about something real? I would say the clear answer to that is no. And I would just tell people to just trust their intuition on that. <laughs> I mean, yeah, really. that I mean, and that's it's really the his his sociology is the most attractive the thing about him to me. And that's why I keep reading. Uh, honestly, I, I, I find, I find like it, it something very profound about it, but at the same time, it's like, I, I understand people's hesitance to engage with something that kind of makes explicit that, which according to, to tradition is maybe better served left hidden, you know? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, yeah, exactly. You don't need to understand if you, if you weep when you see an image of the Virgin, you don't need to understand Bogakov's sociology. Everything <laughs> you need to understand is already there. Right. It's already touching when you, you in, when, in the right, right way. Right. Exactly. When you are touched by and weep in the presence of an image of the Virgin, you already understand everything you need to know. You don't yeah. need to understand the systematic side of it. You it's don't. a good point. It's a good you point. You just yeah, have to have a relationship with our mother. That's it. Yeah. So, yeah. Totally agree. Yeah. Okay. I, or maybe maybe that's a good place to end it. I don't. I know. I think that's um, a great note to end it on. I, I yeah. just really thank you for for coming today, Kenneth. It was really great to get to know you and to have this conversation. I hope we get to of have course, a chance man. to talk again sometime. You're welcome back anytime. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Nate. Thank you all for listening. <laughs>